and you know, if you look at NYPD, the NYPD, um, they, somebody um, made it aware that because of what's happened in New York, that every police officer in New York is now work has to work has to be available to work seven days a week, twelve hour shifts. Mm-hmm. So it's only a matter of time before they're exhausted as well. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because we can swap people off, take days off, but they can't. Right. right. So all we so we we just have to outlast them. You know. Mm-hmm. And at right. some point, they're going to have to conform because the Blasio, man, I, I really, I really would have thought that a, a man raising black children in his house would have would have dealt with this a lot differently. Would have had a little bit more empathy, and but he didn't, and that's how his daughter ends up getting arrested at the protests. You right. know what I'm saying? And then he wants to talk about how good of a child his child is. Well, why aren't you talking like that about George Floyd? Why aren't you talking like that about Breonna Taylor and all these other victims of violence? Why don't you take a parental um, outlook on this situation, mm-hmm. right? And have a, a better level of understanding. But no, you want to put the hard fist down in New York, you know, be the typical New York mayor, and then your kid gets arrested. Now, all of a sudden, mm-hmm. you're trying to profess how good your black child is. Well, guess what? We've been all trying to collectively say this about our black children for decades, yet y'all st- still treated them like animals, specifically on the streets of New York. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So now mm-hmm. that you have a more informed view of what happens to our children outside trying to do the right thing standing on the right side of history you should have you should have the the ability to to show more compassion in this situation right pull back the reins but no that's what happens when when you know mayors and cities um really just just give everything over to the police department because i'm, I'm not saying that I, like i understand a mayor needs a police department right like he needs to have a good relationship with the police department because there are things that he needs the police to do but at the same time like your constituents should matter as well. And you shouldn't give more power to the people that police your constituents than the constituents themselves. Because the police can't, the, the police will be fine whether we vote you out or not. They don't lose their job. Mm-hmm. Like they're not elected officials. So we we vote your ass out, the same cops that you're taking up for, them motherfuckers will still be there when you're gone. Right. Right. They'll still be coming after your kid too. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Now, that, now that her dad isn't married anymore, they may target him. Mm-hmm. Why is it so mad? Why is it so hard for people to um to just say Black Lives Matter? Like, why is this? Like, it's, it's, because it, it's, it's not it's because they're racist. <laughs> Bottom line, if you can't say it, it's because you're racist. It's no, there's nothing else to say because you have to be a racist. There is a level of racism that you do not want to give up this power. You know, just like when we was talking about Dolan, he doesn't want to say it because he wants the people who are racist to know. I don't want to say it. You don't hear Trump say Black Lives Matter. He does never say that. He, he just would never say it because he understands that his constituency is, is, is his whole base is built on the fact that white is supreme. He says it. He said it. He said it. First of all, I'm a nationalist. You know what I'm saying? If you, if you know the history of nationalism, it is white supremacy. You know what I'm saying? So the bottom line is they don't want to say it because they don't want to give up their power. That's why we and you just think about this. We are really in this position because white supremacy is, is so strong that the police department refused to lock up four officers that everybody saw kill somebody. Yep. Just think about it. All they had to do was arrest these people from the beginning. We wouldn't. It wouldn't have been no riots. It wouldn't have been no marches. It would have been nothing. They would have seen it. People were like, damn, that's the mess of the year they arrest the officers. And they would have said, that's good. You know, at least you're doing something. And they kept on. They dragged this shit on for for over a week. And we had to hit the streets every day. They burnt down the whole police station. They refused to give in because white supremacy is such a, a disease that they would let the country, they'll destroy the country before they give up their power. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I want to, I'm sorry, I was calling my, my engineer because my, my phone about to die, but I want to um, talk about Black Lives Matter for a second. Black Lives Matter... This, this, the whole system is geared to make sure that black lives don't matter, which is why, which is why those three women started that organization. And I, I think what they did was revolutionary. I put it on the same level as what King and them was doing in the, in the 60s, because to take that phrase, black lives matter, it's like Malcolm said, make it plain. Just make it simple and plain. Black lives matter. Now, if you look at the Black Lives Matter website, in the last two years, Black Lives Matter was more an uh, organization that was active 
Uh, they started with Trayvon Martin, then they got really active around Mar- uh, uh, around Mike Brown, and then they sort of used the platform, those three sisters used the platform that they built with Black Lives Matter to go move into other other work. So um, Alicia Garza from Black Lives Matter now is working with an organization called Black Future Labs, and they put out a 27-page Black agenda. I think the website is blacktothefuture.org, and I encourage everybody to go read their Black agenda because it's a Black agenda that's thoroughly researched. It takes census information and polling information into consideration. So they're saying our Black agenda is based on what we researched to see what Black America is asking for. It's radical, it's revolutionary, and I have to completely support it. Uh, Patrice Colores from Black Lives Matter, probably the most visible member of it, she's now working more with Movement for Black Lives. And Movement for Black Lives is an organization that you see pushing to defund the police, and they, they, they now partner with Essence. But what I want to say is that on the Black Lives Matter website, there's stuff about COVID, there's general stuff, but they haven't been, the organization Black Lives Matter has not at all been at the forefront of the the, the, the uprisings and the marches uh, to, to support uh, George Floyd. But what started to happen is the work they did was so phenomenal. The, that phrase was so ubiquitous and so dope that anybody who uses that phrase, people just want to use that phrase whether they support the principles of Black Lives Matter or not. When you go on the Black Lives Matter website, there's a whole bunch of stuff that people who use that hashtag and that phrase probably don't even agree with. No, there's a whole, whole bunch of a whole bunch of political stuff and stuff about intersectionality. Some people are like, "Nah, I don't fuck with that intersectionality." Some black people are like, "Nah, don't call me a person of color." Nah, I don't think that queer rights and queer issues should be be part of our struggle. And all of that is on the Black Lives Matter page. So when you see People say Sean King is a Black Lives Matter activist. He's not, regardless how you feel about Sean King, he's never been a member of Black Lives Matter. Regardless how you feel about D. Ray McKesson, he's never been a member of Black Lives Matter. Anytime you see someone holding up a sign, anyone putting a hashtag, they are called a Black Lives Matter activist. And I feel like that's been part of the problem is that it's those sisters were, they were almost too successful for, for their own good. Black Lives Matter as an organization, as a hashtag, was such a good idea that everybody wants to buy into it, but not everybody's doing the work to call themselves a Black Lives Matter activist. People are using it now as a term to antagonize the power structure. Right. Mm-hmm. Without really even understanding who created it, what it truly stands for, and, and what the, the thoughts and the thought process behind it, the policies that they're pushing behind it. People say it now just to piss old white people off. Like it's almost becoming something that trolls. Like our MAGA hat. It's almost like becoming our MAGA hat. Right, right. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get that comparison. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's basically but, but now being co opted for people to troll people into like showing their racism. And, you know, and it's crazy. It's crazy. You, that shows you how white supremacist the country we live in, that people are antagonized by saying the black... You say this? That's crazy. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Bruh. We ain't like, saying it's better. We ain't saying nothing. We just saying they just matter. It matters. Let it matter. Why are we going to be mad that it matters? It's just... It's crazy. You ever thought you ever thought we would be here in this country? Like, you know, after Martin, after Malcolm, we thought we was going to move forward. It almost felt like... It, it, we moved back. And not only did we feel like we moved back, but here's the crazy things. You know, with a lot of these great protests and these great, you know, when we come out and we march and we get together, mm-hmm. um, and you see these great pictures, right now it's crazy. It was like COVID was almost planned to not see our leaders. Like, you know, because <laughs> it was like, you know, like the, y- your face is not being shown. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, is, 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 did that feel weird to anybody else here or that's just me? No, I mean, you know, this COVID shit is a whole other conversation. And, and I, I think you're right on, on multiple levels. But one thing is, for me, COVID was the first problem, right? So, so the idea that, that Black people getting killed by the state right. is the point. But that sense of vulnerability and insecurity that you feel from the state doesn't just begin when police shoot you. Just like in Ferguson, it wasn't just when police shot you in Ferguson or Baltimore or Texas. It was Flint, Michigan with the water. Mm-hmm. Similarly, we don't feel protected by the state right now. In the same way, Donald Trump isn't, didn't cause COVID, but he's responsible for, for there being so many deaths. And who was dying from COVID? People who were poor. We say essential workers are 
people who have to do medical work, uh, EMTs, uh, police officers. But if I'm poor and can't afford to work from home or do a Zoom and I got to work at Target or Walmart so rich people can stock up for the week, I'm now on the front lines as an essential worker as well, except I'm only making minimum wage. And so I'm vulnerable because the state couldn't protect me. They gave me, they gave Wall Street and, the, and other people trillions. They gave me a $1,200 check that I might get by the end of the summer to last the whole time. And so the state's failure to protect me caught, subjects me to premature death. That same premature death is what happens to George Floyd. So the COVID shit is the backdrop to all of this. COVID is just a metaphor for all the ways that the state either kills us or doesn't stop us from dying from premature death. And then on top of that, your point is the rebellion, the resistance to it, the mask we put on to, to protect our lives. And then we go out in the streets to fight this other shit. And we got the mask on, which is, again, a metaphor for the way that we got to pre- defend ourselves from the state, from state surveillance, from state violence, from state harassment. It, 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 it's a crazy situation. And the craziest shit of all is that, for example, I got a 92 year old father. Right. And. I, I, I want to see him. I haven't been able to see him in three months, right? They, 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 we met with the hospice team. So, you know, they were like, we don't know how much longer he has. I can't see him. Um, but if I go on the streets and protest and then I can go see him, now I'm putting his life at risk, right? So I got, and, and so black people all around the country, all around the, uh, America are deciding right now between staying at home and not protesting the state killing us or going outside and risk dying from COVID. Exactly. I mean, th- that's what it means to be black in America. You either die fast or you die slow. But you die. And, but you die. Right. Prematurely. Right. And that's the shit that I'm talking about. So that COVID shit is, for me, I'm glad you brought that up, is so important to this conversation. And you die alone in either situation. Ooh, yes. You die alone. Mm-hmm. Like, that's, that's the cold, ugly part of it, right? And that's, you know, somebody said the other day that with COVID going on, and the, the unemployment level and everybody kind of being restricted to home, basically all of these things come together to make George Floyd's death undeniable, right? <laughs> like everybody's all at home at the same time, hit with the same imagery with nothing to distract them from it, right? Like all the things that, you know, where usually, you know, you come in seven, eight o'clock, you're tired, you know what I'm saying? All of this shit and you you're not really paying attention to a lot of these things. But now you're home, you're all day. There's nothing to do but watch TV. And so you're flooded with this imagery, right? And so there's nowhere to turn from it, right? You're forced to look at it and deal with it. And and I think that's that's been one of the, sil- the partially a silver lining to all of this shit that we're dealing with right now is the fact that everybody all, the, all over the world, right, are dealing with this in real time. Right, no. COVID is a situation. Oh man, Bono gets cut off when he's making. Great- when right. he things start going crazy, he gets cut off. Right. Bon, where you at? Uh, you made, you, everybody made some real good points about the COVID situation, man. It just it exacerbated what's going on with Black America, man. And and George Floyd, I say it's like a perfect storm. Everything that happened here is a perfect storm, you That's know. Right. And COVID it started with COVID nineteen, putting us in our house, making us have to deal with trauma, deal with fear, you know, deal with reality, seeing these things. And, and like you said, like he said, everybody had to visually see this every day. And, you know, and then it was the anxiety of being inside. So some people decided, you know, I'm going to go outside because I'm just tired of being inside. And the only way I can get outside and really do something is go protest. So you got the protest people that are there to protest. You got the people that just tired of being in their house that just going to go outside and protest. You got the people that say they looting, so I'm going to go outside and loot. You go, you got, you know, you got so many different dimensions and it created a perfect storm. So you don't, it don't matter who's there for what. It's just thousands and hundreds of thousands of millions of people every day, constantly. And it's, it's right. lending the voice to the people who actually are there protests, who actually been on the front lines doing it. So being on the front line doing this for the last nine, 10 years, I've realized that it takes that. That's what it yeah. takes. It takes It takes a perfect storm. It takes so many different people to have intersectional reasons why you're here. We don't have to, like I tell people all the time, it's not about uniformity. It's about unity. Unity and uniformity yeah. are yes. the, the same thing. Like We don't have to have agree on everything. We just all got to agree that something needs to change. You think this needs to change? I think this needs to change. All right, let's 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 figure out how we're going to change it. And that's yeah. where it is right now. I think everybody who, it don't care about race, Religious denomination, we all realize shit is fucked up here. Yeah, you know, we and, and we got to get this shit changed. You know, we all got to see this change. And I think I'm in different 
conversations or different Zoom calls in different rooms where it's really people creating shit that's going, I believe, is going to make real change because right. now they realize that they, we got them on the ropes. You know, the big, the boogeyman, it's like the America was this boogeyman. Like, you know, the police, like people like, people mad at me, like, yo, they, they're rioting and you know, and you need to tell people to be peaceful. And I'm like, what the fuck I'm going to tell somebody to be peaceful? We, we, we out here chanting every day, no justice, no peace. And we ain't getting no justice. So why would I tell people to be peaceful? Right. It don't make sense. It don't coincide with the struggle we've been having. You understand what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, when you look at this situation, you see, dang, people are out there doing this every day. People are constantly out there every day. Why are they doing it? It's because the shit is fucked up for so many different people, man. America has failed. So we there was this boogeyman, like I was saying. The police, we, we were taught to be scared. You know, my grandmother said, yo, don't say, don't talk too loud. The white man gonna hear you. Or the police mm-hmm. gonna hear yeah, you. Yeah. These kids don't have that fear. I'm not putting that fear in them. They don't, they, 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 um, slavery and all that shit is, is so far removed from them. It's just something to hear about. We had little glimpses. Of, we had grandfathers who actually went through slavery, who set us down, who you looked at them and they showed you scars and they told you they was in the wars and you could see the pain in their face. So you 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 internalize that. My kids are not going to internalize that. They're going to hear the stories, but they're going to see their father, a free black man who lives, who's willing to die for his for his country, I mean, for his revolution, for his people who's willing to stand on the front lines, and they're going to live their lives like that. And that's why these kids are out there. I was in Minnesota when they burnt down the police, and they was throwing, the kids is, they throwing, they shooting rubber bullets, and these kids is creating their own Molotov cocktails, throwing them shit back. Like, fuck that. They, the, the, the tear gas is in their eyes, they going, they wiping it out, pouring milk in, and they coming right back. They wasn't that's running right. home, because we would have ran home before. As soon as they, they threw the, the tear gas, it was over for us. All right, we, we gonna come back another day. Nah, they was out there for 24 hours straight. The police had to run out the police station. I watched them. They was throwing Molotov cocktails. The police shooting. They on the roof. Next thing you know, the police got overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. They got overwhelmed and they burnt down the police station. This shit was, this is something that's never, and this resilience that these kids have, these fearlessness that these kids have is the, the exact ingredient that we need to really make change. Yeah, I want to I want to add on. Um, first of all, that the kid who brought, they just arrested the kid who burnt down the police station. It was a white kid. Um, I'm not sure if he's an anti-fascist or he's just you know uh, an op. I don't really know, but but uh, but yeah, he um, he definitely did that. My my daughter, I had to watch my daughter on Instagram out there with the people, and that was scary for me because it's like it's my daughter, but then it's like. It's like, yo, she's just doing what I would have did. That's what I told him. Exactly. Like, I, I was with, with Dave Chappelle. He was talking. I watched him talk to his son. He said, he said, he said, here's my son. He said, my son got tear gassed the other day in Dayton, Ohio. So I'm very proud of him. You know what I'm saying? So it, it, it speaks to what you're speaking about, about we, we come from the generation where our parents try to protect us because they, they seen the horrors of what's going on. And we like, nah, fuck that. Get out there and do your thing. But also wanted to add on to the point you said about striking now while iron's hot. You know, when when they had the Civil War, they had a general who said, look, if you um, come and fight for the Union Army, you get 40 acres and a mule. And uh, obviously they never gave us that. And obviously they, they reversed that. But the reason why the general said that, because he, he realized that he needed to compromise with the black people at that time. And now we in one of those type of civil war moments. Um, I would never say race war because I think that it's only white supremacists that push the idea of race war. That's not something that we've ever, ever pushed. They like like the meme says, they lucky that we only want equality and not revenge. You know, but I, I did write down some points because I've been talking with same as you, my son. I've been talking with different organizations and having these different calls. And for me personally, these are these are just without getting into the specifics. These are the, the policy changes that I feel like the things that we all can work for. Because, like you said, my son, it's it's about unity, not uniformity. And and to figure out what we can all agree to push together, even if everybody on this particular call doesn't agree with these points. These are the things I wrote down that I would like to see coming out this moment. Um, as, as sort of a black agenda. Um, workers' rights, us making sure that we, we support unions and support the rights of workers because it's, it's people who are uh, uh, poor people of color who disproportionately get fucked up by us not making sure that the workers are taken care of. I think we should raise the federal, federal minimum wage. The federal minimum wage hasn't been raised since 2009. Um, I think we need 
a congressional committee on reparations. I think now is the time. There's been a reparations bill, the HR 40 bill that's been floating around for years, but because we have no con- congressional committee and we have no, and the c- people in the community are not pushing the politicians, it just sits there and it lingers. Now is the time to have the conversation. If you, if you look at Joe Biden's platform, he mentions reparations on his platform. He wanted the only Democratic senators that's not out of the ones who ran for president who not who so did not on his his so called black agenda. Yeah, in his black agenda, okay. he says okay. that he said he describes the HR forty bill. He says I will support this bill, but he doesn't name the bill. So what he's trying to do, he's trying to say like I'll be down for reparations if, if y'all are, but he's not really really putting putting his weight behind that that thing. Uh, but I think we can we can we can move. The Democrats on that issue. Right. Um, and just real quick, quite before I interrupt you, remember HR forty is not a bill for reparations. Right. It's a bill study. To, to study it. That's so, right. So he won't even acknowledge that he's willing to study it. I mean, that's right. a, he ain't even asking that much. Right. Well, that's what he's. That's the thing. Like he's doing it, but he's being slick with it. If you go to his page, it says, "I'm down to support a bill that will support the study of reparations." <laughs> right. That bill already exists, and right. and going, it ain't going nowhere. Right. You know I mean? So that's why I, that's why I'm saying that the, the the congressional commission, and I say that with a grain of salt because my history tells me that even with a congressional commission, this, we still have a it's still a long shot. But it's, it's a step past the, where is that now? Yeah, no. um, um, defund the police. You know, I feel like the, the people, the movement for Black Lives, everybody's had done the work to explain why we need to defund the police. Um, there's an American Housing and Economic Mobility Act that that analysts say if this act is passed. It will it will it will wipe out some of the racial disparities in housing. Um, I, I do believe we need Medicare for all, specifically for the reasons that Mark outlined when he's talking about how COVID outlines uh, how COVID affects Black people disproportionately. I think now more than ever we can make the case for Medicare for all, and I think we should abolish the electoral college. I feel like with the electoral college and money in politics, we can't get political parties. We can't have third parties. We can't have the real 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 uh, political power we need. And lastly. I think we should work on together charging the United States with genocide. People have tried it before. Paul Robeson have tried it. There's a group of young teenagers out of Chicago that tried it. But I feel like if we have the UN, again, the UN is not a, it's not a legislative body. There's, we won't get no money out of that. It'll just be a sort of a finger a finger wagon. Right. But if we if we get that finger wagon on paper, we it, it then helps our case. We go to the federal government if if we're working within that system to try to get reparations. It absolutely will help our case for reparations. And I think we need to we need to build, like my man Jay Morrison always says, we need to build a nationality. We don't have a flag, we don't have our own nationality, and that's why it's harder for us to get reparations because they're like, who are we gonna give it to? You know, mm-hmm. we have to we have to identify ourselves because black American, you know, black is not a color, is not a nationality, it's not nothing under one banner. So we have to come together and get somewhere to sponsor us as this is who we are. This is our flag, this is what we are, and this is what we need for us to get reparation. That's the problem. There's so many people that are like, how do you how are you supposed to like give it? Marcus Garvey was preaching, right? Yeah, exactly. That's one of the things we gotta figure out. So um, all right, Obama, right? Do we feel like Obama didn't really correct police? Do you feel like he could he could have did a lot more when it came to police? Because I feel like Trump is doing whatever the fuck he wants when it comes to police, right? He's standing behind them. I feel like Obama could have did the, the pretty much the opposite and like really fired got somebody mm-hmm. you know, go go to am I am I bugging like do you like no, I mean no, uh, so I went to I went to a meeting about this at the White House with Obama and a bunch of rappers and um it was uh, Nicki Minaj Pusha T. Yeah. Rick Ross was there with an ankle bracelet on. It was, it was, you know, Buster, there, Rimes, Buster Rimes was kicking five percent of knowledge and all that. Yeah. Um, and and I, before before I, I talk about that meeting, I want to mention we we big up Kim Kardashian for pushing Trump on on prison reform and letting some people out. And and Trump did absolutely do that. But I don't think that we should give him props for that because he did it like Bun was saying for the optics. Donald Trump he ran on a law and order campaign. When those when those when those people ran out there to, to protest, he called them thugs and said, "Police, you should shoot those people if they take property." You know what I'm saying? Donald Trump, when he was campaigning, he went to the police, police policemen's benevolent association and spoke in front of them and said, "When you have a suspect and you pushing them in, in the car, rough them up a little bit, right?" So this is a fascist. This is someone who says that the police should have the right to 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 disrespect your right to not care about you. So the idea that he's releasing, I don't give him props for that. Obama. 
he wanted to make his campaign about police reform. He wanted to seem like the president that released people. So history, the history books will tell you Obama released more, more prisoners than anybody. Now, Obama also, I don't agree with him on immigration. I think he has a lot. I think his drone strikes the way there's a lot of a lot of criticisms can be made about Obama and his, and his administration. But I think when it comes to his goal as a president was to try to try to be the criminal justice reform president. And I will say as someone, I went, I took, I took a lot of um, talking points from activists, from my most radical activist friends on police reconstruction and police reform, if you want to call it that. When I went into that meeting with Obama, then I got to say the brother's smart. He crosses his eyes, he dots his T's. He said things in that meeting that I thought that me as an activist, I was going to have to bring to the table. And Obama and his team got to the table. So when it comes to the work, when it comes to the academic work of being down with criminal justice reform and being down with police reform. I believe that Obama, and to a large degree, most of the establishment Democrats, they know the language, they talk the language, but to, a lot of them is just for optics. I feel like for Obama, it's more close to his heart because he's actually a black man with the name Barack Hussein Obama. Um, but essentially, you know, the, the Republicans became the party of obstruction. So even though Obama did everything right, the Republicans made sure that they were gonna say no to everything that he did. When you when you when you just even look at prison reform, right? Mm-hmm. And you talk about how they talk about how Trump let some people out and this and that. Obama commuted more presidents, more people than the last five or six, seven, eight presidents combined. Mm-hmm. And that's only because when he was trying to pretty much let all non nonviolent offenders out of prison, they blocked that. Mm-hmm. So he had to do that. So these are things that people don't know. He's like, oh. Obama, no, they blocked. He was trying to let, he was trying to, all drug offenders, he was trying to get them all out of prison. Like, all of them. He didn't want none of them in jail. You know what I'm saying? So when you look at this prison reform that Trump has done, and people say, oh, look, he let this amount of people out of jail. No. The, 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 the bill that that Obama was trying to get out would have let every, they would have been home. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So he, he gave you a fraction of what Obama was getting and tried to tell you he did something. Because he had the party who was in control to make those those changes. How about how about you, Mark? You know, I'm I've been an Obama critic. Um, I think that I mean Trump is a whole different animal. So I, it's almost a, it's a, you can't even compare him to anything else. You know, like he, he, there are good presidents, there's bad presidents. Trump's like not even like that. He's like a different thing. He's like a different sport, like a different creature, a different being. Um, I think that Obama at the federal level, as he was leaving, especially made some important moves. Uh, cash bail in the federal system gone. Um, private privatized prisons gone. Right, these things that that but the felony thing with the, the voting as a felony. Right, right. Being able to vote. Being a felony. felon trying to vote. Rather. Right, exactly. I mean, these are major. These are abolitionist moves. You know. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, as president, he, that's all he can do. He can't. Most people in jail on the state level. Most people in prison on the state level. So he can't deal with people who are doing state time. Only people who are doing fed time. So he did what he could at that level. Do I wish he could have done more? Yes. Do I wish he had said more? Yes. There, are, but Obama. One of the challenges for Obama for me was that he played the game as if everybody was playing by the same rules. It's like if you're negotiating and you say, look, I want to, I want to, I want five, so I'm going to ask for 10, they're going to offer zero and we'll meet in the middle. Republicans, he'll be, Obama will come and say, look, let's just say five. And <laughs> Trump was like, zero. So it would turn, <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, and they'd be, like, they'd be like, all right, 2.5, they'd be like, zero. And before you know it, this nigga, he ended up with one. Right. Exactly. And, and that's how bills go. Republicans just played by different rules because, like Kwali said, they were a party of obstruction. Their goal wasn't to get laws passed. They would have stopped everything from happening. And so there were moments where Obama was too careful, where he tried to thread the needle, where he tried to say, well, black people feel like this and white people feel like this. And acting as if they're opposite sides of the same coin. Obama didn't speak to black pain enough. Exactly. Obama didn't speak to black suffering enough. And Obama didn't put a spotlight on black misery enough. But again, if we compare it to Trump or Bush or anybody yeah, else, President Never. Right. I mean, but but I'm yeah. yeah, but I mean it's like I almost don't want to compare him to that because that seems unfair. You know, if, even compared to Clinton, he's a step above, right? Because Clinton, again, not just three strikes, not just welfare reform, not just crime bill, but also the prison litigation reform act, which is the act that made it difficult for prisoners to fight their own cases. Right. That made it hard to be a jailhouse lawyer, that made it hard to file appeals. Um, all these things. So 
Democrats have a long history of building this stuff with Republicans. Obama pushed back against some of it, but no, he did not go hard enough, right? When he says, when Henry Louis Gates, the professor at Harvard, gets locked up in front of his house and he, go, he, and he says the, the officer behaved stupidly, that's a great moment. But it's easy to speak out when it's, a, you, you know what I mean, when it's a Harvard professor. When it's, when it's Skip Gates. Right, when it's Skip Gates, it's easy. But I need you to speak out when, when, when it's Shaquan Jenkins, right? I need you to speak out when it's somebody that don't nobody know, when it's somebody who might have weed in their system, when it's somebody who might have a criminal record. They still don't deserve to die or go to jail for excessive time. Who so, got weed in their system? Right, right. Who don't, right? <laughs> so so that's my point. So so I need that's what I need Obama to speak out against, and he didn't, you know, and that's my that, concern with that's, that was my exact same critique, Mark. I say all the time. Obama never had a real position to me. It was like right. he wanted to be liked by everybody. And, and 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 that's the thing about Trump. He don't give a fuck if we like him. Because he right. voted for somebody. You understand? He here, he know who got him in office, and he gonna make sure that they comfortable. Even if he lose whatever he look, this wall is going up. He don't give for how mad you get. He promises people this wall is going up and he gonna keep talking about this wall. He gonna keep talking about this shit. He gonna keep talking about how we need to beat each other's ass. He, he is the law and order president. The he's man, still talking about the wall? I thought he gave the wall up. No, the you think, that man still, he ain't give that wall up. He's still oh. talking about the, they gonna get that wall. He still got funding. They got a bunch of money to build the wall. They in the process of building something. But the reality of the situation, he never stopped. He's played to his base every time. And Obama didn't rile us up. It was time we was ready to ride with Obama. He just went up there and said this, we would have turned this bitch out. And the, that's Democrats in general, too. Obama as their leader. But that's where the Democrats fucking up. He was ready, man. Now, what do we do, now, what do we do right now for, you know, the people with the last election, with the, the lesser evils, with the Hillary and, and things like that? Is, is people feeling like that about Joe Biden? Joe Biden put out a black agenda. A lot of people thought it was bland. A lot of people thought it was just generic. And Trump don't have a black agenda at all. And he said, and he said you ain't black if you don't like my agenda. Right. <laughs> black if you ain't both for him. Like, what, y'all you, niggas don't like what I'm talking about? Y'all niggas is you not black. black. Right. <laughs> and yo, know, he's trying to say, he's trying to say Trump is so much of a racist, he's the better. That's yeah. like exactly saying, like, I'm the the, 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 the lesser of the better evil. Like, mm -hmm. what is our people? I know we, I spoke to Killer Mike, and Killer Mike was saying, a lot of our local elections is more important than the, the these major elections. Like, he's right. The right, right people in, in, in city, as opposed to what do you, what do you guys say to uh, to everyone? So for me, I'm someone who has publicly publicly said in the past that I don't vote, and I gave what I believed at the time to be very sound reasons. Um, I don't believe in electoral college. I don't believe in money in politics. There was there, I I don't I don't I'm not inspired by any of these candidates. I don't feel like a candidate that would speak to me even has a shot. So I I I chose to opt out of the system. But I felt comfortable in my decision because I was also doing plenty of activist work. So I was like, okay, I'm not voting, but I also do work on this level. I personally, as I've grown as a man, changed my stance on voting, particularly when I read about how Malcolm X, Link Malcolm is my hero. When I read about how Malcolm changed his stance on voting to being like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't vote for Democrat or Republican to, to, and he made very, very astute criticisms of both parties to then working with Adam Clay and Powell to get the black vote in Harlem to, to galvanize the black vote and vote together as a block to use the, the vote the same way that other communities have used the vote, whether it's Italian community to Jewish communities. So now I, I shifted my thinking on it. I grew on it and I got older. But because I was once one of those people who was like, fuck voting, I never, ever, ever shame someone who says that they don't vote. I don't shame someone for being so disheartened by the system that they'd be like, that system doesn't represent me. You know, I still believe that a person like that has good work that they can do. I do not believe that voting, the act of voting by itself makes you an activist or makes you a revolutionary. It doesn't. I do understand the politics of, of how the Electoral College makes it so that a vote, me voting Democrat in New York doesn't hold the same weight as somebody voting Democrat in Ohio. So I understand all of it, but I still... What I say is like, I say is like, look, if you're going to play a game, play it right. If you choose not to play that game, it's like I'm not going to show up in the NFL and try to play by NBA rules and wonder why I'm losing. Right. So if you if you choose to remove yourself from the system, then you better show me your activist work. Show me the work that you're doing outside of the system to bring the system down, to break the status quo. And if you're not doing that work, all you're doing is fucking complaining. Now, if you are somebody who says, you know what, I'm willing to try to work within the system to try to create change, then you got to acknowledge the reality, the reality of the system. If you're somebody that says, I want reparations, 
but I'm not giving you my vote and I'm a single issue voter and I'm, I'm not doing anything is reparations now. I don't care about the study. I don't care. Reparation now, you're not giving my vote. Well, you don't understand how the system works. It's, a, it's an exchange. You're saying they should exchange with you, but you ain't offer shit to, to exchange them with. They don't, they don't need you for their system to work. So I think people, and this is my opinion here, I think people who say that I'm going to protest vote for, I'm going to write in, I'm going to vote Green Party, I'm going to do all this. To me, I respect it if that's a moral stance you're taking, but the math the math shows me that if you if you don't vote Democrat or Republican, if you choose to vote in the system for the president, then what you're doing is you're making sure that the winner wins. Like whoever wins, that's who you helped out. That's just what the math shows me. So if you're comfortable with the fact that your protest vote or your third party vote, even though in a, in a no. fair, perfect world. Y'all, that's a debate. Look at Mark. You ready? Yeah, I see him. I see him. In a, in, in a fair, perfect world, I think that Voting on our conscience is is what everybody should be doing. But I think that if you you are going to say, you know what, I'm going to play by their rules in this situation, then you have to acknowledge the math in, in a presidential election. I don't think those rules apply to more local elections. Oh, that's true. You, you can win a Green Party mayor seat. Right, right, right. Whatever. I, I think as somebody who's voted Green the last four elections, uh, last four presidential elections, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I, and look, I get hell on Twitter every day from that. I, yeah, but I, you also, brother, you also fly to Palestine and do the work. Like, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, keep yeah, going, no, keep I, going. I, I ain't got no shame about it. You know, yeah. I, know I know I'm doing the best I can. But, you know, I think the, I think it's, it's about strategically voting, right? Mm-hmm. Right now, you can say the country's on fire, and the best thing we could do to put it out is to get Donald Trump out. I think that's a legitimate argument. And somebody will say voting green makes that harder to happen. I could understand that too. And those were the stakes in 2016. That, that, that I understood that too. So what I did in 2016 was I voted green because you're right, the math doesn't work that green could win. But, but if we got 5% of the vote, what we would then get is federal funding for the next election so that now we could be competitive because Democrats get tens of millions of dollars and Republicans get tens of millions of dollars just for existing. Right. And they don't. So if we get 5% of the vote, we get the same money they get. And now we can really fight. So the goal was to get 5%. So how do I get the 5% without giving up the country to Trump? So what a lot of us did was vote trading. So for example, like you mentioned, in New York, if I call my homie in New York and say, look, I need you, I need you to vote green because it don't right. okay. Hillary going to win. I'm in Pennsylvania. So I'll, I'll vote for Hillary in Pennsylvania, but you got to vote green in New York, right? Mm-hmm. Call somebody in Texas. Trump going to win Texas no matter what. Trump going to win Mississippi no matter what. So you vote, vote, you know, vote your conscience in safe states Vote strategically in contested states. That's a way where you can you can split the middle, right? You can you can get mm-hmm. the votes that you need to win the election and keep Trump out, and you can protect the part the, the third party vote. And that's what I was trying to do. The problem is when I say, look, I'm voting for Jill Stein, you know, and I don't acknowledge the, the strategy behind it as much. Then what people do is for the next four years they vote shame you and act like you're the reason that mm-hmm. that people lost, which fucks me up for other reasons because, like in my state, Pennsylvania. Uh, Trump won by 46,000 votes. There was 236,000 black people who didn't vote at all. Right. So to me, <laughs> the, the, there's two people you should be mad at. The people that voted for Trump and the people who didn't vote. See, now I'm glad I'm having this conversation because, you know, my, cri- my criticism um, for people who would do follow your strategy has always been the other what, you're saying, what you're saying sounds good, but if you're only saying that, Three months out of a presidential election, if you're only if you're only critical of the system when it's time to vote for president because it's all on the news, then you I don't want to hear what you're talking about. I'm I'm down. I think we need money out of politics. I think we need to abolish the electoral college, and I think we need to abolish a two party system. I'm down. I'm down to follow the lead. I'm, I don't know the research, and I'm not putting myself in that space. I'm not. I'm not out here doing that work. I'm not out here doing the work to abolish the electoral college. I never even me, me saying it to y'all. As, a, as something I feel like we could push now, it's the first time I've even thought critically of how it could possibly be done. Mm. But I appreciate real activists like you, Mark, people who do the work outside of the election cycle. If you're not working, if you not working within the four years to abolish the electoral college, to get people to, to raise a candidate that might run green or run a third party, to raise a candidate from the activist community, and, and like that's, that's really what it is, is the work that's done before and after election day that I feel like is what makes me respect somebody if they're going to vote with their conscience. I, re- I hear that. I-, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. 
Another I'm um, ending it. I'm ending it. Everyone just and say some something last, you know what I mean? Thank y'all all for, for being here, man. I want to thank you, man. You know, whenever you call, I'm there. Ain't nothing, you know. Mix it up. But go ahead, go ahead, my, my bad. But, um, yeah, like what I wanted, like what he said was very important, man. You know, a lot of these organizations have been compromised because mm-hmm. they take money from the corporations. We can't fight the people that's funding us. You know, right. what I'm and, and that's what until freedom doesn't want to be. That's that's what we built ourselves on, on being that institution that is funded by us. So we can, our voices can always be pure. So we can say the shit that you, we need to say, that we can call out whoever we can fight against whoever, you know? So that's why we don't take corporation money. We don't want, we don't never want, we want our people to fund us, you know? So we don't call it, we don't call it donations. We call it investments. You know, mm-hmm. so we, 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 we want you to invest in your own freedom. If you believe in what we believe in, if you believe that we're fighting the manner that you want, if you want to connect with us, you know, invest in that. We have to invest in our own because that's the only way to keep our voices, you know, to keep our voices pure and be able to say what the fuck we want to say. You know, Tamika was able to make that speech because we're not funded by anybody. Because, you know, when she was at Women's March with certain shit she couldn't say because there was different people, you know, corporations and things that were behind it. So we we understood that. We made those mistakes before. Those are the mistakes that we don't want to do again. We got to fund our own movements. We can't ask anybody else to do it. We can't think that it's going to happen without funding our movements because the reality of the situation is the people on the opposite side, Trump is being funded by billionaires. You know, they and they have an agenda and they're funding it and they're making sure that it's, you know, they, they're, it's concentrated. So we have to do the same thing. So that's what we're doing at Until Freedom Man. And we, we ask everybody to invest, invest in us and support us, man. Yeah, yeah Finn has got something. Don't worry about that. So, Talib, um, yeah. um, on you. Well, first of all, thank you, Nori. Um, to watch your growth as a person, as an artist, has always been inspirational to me as well. And you're one of my favorite people out here. You're using your platform for good. And we appreciate you for that. Um, and you represent the best of us. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate you for that. Um, you know, I think what my son is doing is very important because as an artist, I've learned from doing this type of work that as artists, we are the sun, moon, and stars of our universe. Everything revolves around us. Everything that we as, 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 as successful artists, people who are blessed to be able to do it for a living, it, it, in order for us to get to this point, in a lot of ways, people in our life just got to trust us. And listen to us and follow our lead for our, our, our artistic vision. But with activist work, it's not about that. And with being a good, what I've learned being a good ally to activists is that it's my job as an artist with a platform to uplift the people who are already doing the work. So when you have an artist like my son who has his, his, his experience as, as just a man in New York City, as a black man in New York City, and then his experience as an artist, and he brings it to the table for organization organization like Until Freedom, I feel like that's the right work to do. When I when I, when, when I when I see him uplift Tamika and uplift Until Freedom, that's what gets me excited. I like I, I like to shout out uh, Black Visions in Minneapolis and Reclaim the Block in Minneapolis and Movement for Black Lives because I see a lot of people from different organizations that I rock with personally coalescing under the Movement for Black Lives um, agenda. And um, you know, and I just I, you know I'm 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 happy that. We can do this. And I also think that the next time we do this, uh, next we, we, I'm glad we had Russell, but we definitely have to have a woman's voice as well. The next time we sit down and have this conversation. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and, and let's end it with you, bro. You, hit, you was with me this whole time, bro. <laughs> man, thank you, Mark. Thank you, bro. You helped me down this whole time. I figured, you know, my man EFN, if, and if we're going to get political, um, I, I said, Ram, what, what, a, what, a, what a great host I, I, I could have right here. Oh, man, it's a blessing to be here with you, man. I'm, gl- I'm glad you're doing it because you ain't got to do this. You know what I mean? But, but again, uh, uh, like Kwali said, man, your growth and your, your, your commitment to us matters. You know what I mean? And salute to my son, the work he's doing. We all need to support him. Donate to him, push Absolutely. him. We need to support quality. Don't donate, invest. Invest, okay. exactly. Yes. exactly. That's, that's yes. the right language. No, Thank you're right. You. Investing in us. And that's all I got to say. Let's keep investing in us, man. We got a short-term vision and a long-term vision. The short-term vision is to put these fires out. The short-term vision is to get these officers was to get these officers arrested. The short-term vision is to get Trump out of, out of, out of, out of, out of the White House. But the long-term vision has to be just as important. We can't fight for warmer and fuzzier prisons. We got to fight for a world without them. 
We can't fight for police officers that shoot jump shots with us. We got to fight for a world without policing. We have to have a world that is reimagined. We have to use what we call a radical imagination. So I encourage everybody to struggle in the short term, to use voting not as a, as a, as a silver bullet or as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a fetish, but to use voting as a tactic among an overall strategy of victory for, 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 for oppressed people. And that means we got to organize, we got to read, we got we to gotta invest in each other, we got to believe in each other, we got to not throw each other away, we got to hold each other accountable. You know, we got to be willing to listen and follow the lead of women and, and trans folk and queer folk. I mean, all this has to be part of the conversation because if we don't do that, then we're not going to be free. So I'm going to end with just three words, man. And Robin Kelly, the great historian, uses these three words a lot. Love, study, struggle. We got to do all three. We got to love the shit out of each other. We got to study. We can't just be out here talking. We got to learn and we got to struggle. You might struggle on the front lines. You might struggle on the picket line. You might struggle in your rhymes. You might struggle with your platform. You might struggle through your donations. You might struggle through your vote, but we got to struggle. And if we love, study, and struggle, we're going to be all right. All right. Well, thank y'all very much, man. All y'all, man. Really appreciate this. this is one of the Dream Chat's most favorite, uh, uh, most serious episode ever, man. And I, I take, I take pr- a pride in in, in 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 doing that, man. I didn't drink the whole episode not because I didn't want to have. Fun. I did. Yeah, yeah. Not because I didn't want to have fun, but I wanted to let people know that I could actually do this as well. And I can no doubt. Here, you know? No put, doubt. That's the champion. That's champion part of the drink, drink champs. Exactly. You feel me? You feel me? So thank y'all. But we all gonna do this in person again. In no person, when it comes together. Yeah. Right, Shout out to EFN. Definitely. Right. I love all y'all. Love y'all. Love y'all too. Love you too. Boom. Peace.